Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we're going to proceed to our last panel of the day before we close with our uh, keynote address by uh, Jamil Jaffer. Um, this panel is on intelligence gathering and individual rights, and uh, we're happy to have uh, Professor Shirin Sinar uh, here at the law school chairing the panel. Professor Sinar, she's a Stanford alum, and she focuses on the role of non-judicial institutions in national security oversight. Uh, mm -hmm. She um, previously worked in the Asian um, Law Caucus and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in San Francisco as a civil rights attorney. Um, her, she clerked for uh, Judge Warren Ferguson in the Ninth Circuit Court of, Court of Appeals, and uh, she has a bachelor's from Harvard, master's and Phil at Cambridge in International Relations and JD from Stanford. So thank you very much, Professor Sinar, for joining us. She's also a, con a conference advisor, and she's been extremely um, uh, helpful in, in, in um, uh, setting up the conference. So thank you for your help, and, and thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you. I actually wanted to begin by uh, commending the Stanford Journal on International Law for putting together this conference. Um, it's been a Herculean effort on the part of uh, Jose and Didi and others who have been involved with the enterprise. Um, so I just wanted to commend them for that uh, the incredible lineup that they managed to achieve in, in putting together the event. Uh, so this panel is on the intersection of individual rights and intelligence. You know, I imagine that we will continue much of the discussion that began in the last panel. Uh, the broad goals for the panel uh, are to address a, a couple of core issues. Uh, the first set of issues uh, has to do with the scope of the rights and interests at stake, so the scope of rights to privacy, freedom of expression, and other individual rights uh, related to intelligence collection. Uh, one question related to that scope is the geographic one of whether we are primarily talking about the rights of US persons, as has often been the frame, or whether we're actually talking about a broader uh, international right to privacy and the concerns of people um, outside US jurisdiction. A second question involving the scope of rights uh, uh, relates to whether we're talking about uh, the importance of privacy protections primarily at the point of acquisition and collection of information or primarily at the, t uh, at the point of use of information and the potential of abuse at that point. Um, these are just two of the many questions actually related to defining the scope of rights and interests um, at stake and uh, that's one of the, the large topics that I anticipate this panel will address. Um, a second set of questions has to do with uh, mechanisms for accountability to protect pri privacy, rights of expression, and other individual rights. And again, uh, this is you know, a topic that we've talked about at some length during the conference, um, including the last panel. Um, we, uh, I hope that this uh, very diverse group of panelists uh, from positions within government and outside government uh, will be able to have a robust exchange over what we think about existing mechanisms of accountability, both internal and external, uh, whether we believe they're adequate or not, and in what way they may fall short, um, if they do. Um, and I anticipate we'll have uh, quite a bit of uh, difference of opinion on that, and I look very much forward to, to hearing the views here. Um, so that's a tall order for an hour and a half, um, and uh, let me just quickly introduce each of the panelists. Um, we will start with Beth Van Schack, uh, who is uh, now a, uh, a visiting scholar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. She's a professor of law at Santa Clara University and recently served as the deputy to the U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes in the State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice. Uh, second, we will have Chris Inglis, who retired in January as Deputy Director of the NSA after eight years in that position uh, and a very long career with the institution, uh, including previously serving as the NSA liaison to the uh, British uh, Intelligence Service. Uh, uh, Beth Cook uh, serves as a uh, presidentially appointed member of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which is a bipartisan executive board agency charged with reviewing the government's counterterrorism programs. Um, and she is a partner at Wilmer Hale and uh, served previously as Assistant Attorney General for Legal Policy during the Bush administration. And uh, finally, we have Cindy Cohn, who's the legal director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, its general counsel. Uh, she has litigated multiple cases 
uh, challenging NSA surveillance programs, um, including the involvement of uh, uh, telecom uh, companies in those programs, um, and including also a recent challenge to the NSA phone metadata collection. So uh, let's uh, begin with Beth Benshaw. Great, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. It's been a wonderful gathering, and thanks to the journal and everyone at Stanford for putting together such a terrific program. Um, I should say that I come at this issue really from two perches. On the one hand, I am a human rights scholar, and I've been a human rights practitioner for many years. Um, but while I was in the State Department, I was also a consumer of intelligence. Our office, which was the Office of Global Justice, was charged with um, helping to advise the secretary on um, the, on, on prevention of and responses to atrocities. And so in this regard, we were really dependent on intelligence as to where indicted war criminals and potential war criminals were, were operating, what were they doing, and also in trying to help effectuate President Obama's atrocities prevention mandate and to feed into the work of the Atrocities Prevention Board, we were constantly vigilant for situations of atrocities that were emergent with the idea being that we should think about how to coordinate responses in a preventative capacity so that we didn't have to wait until after atrocities had happened. And so we were very dependent on a robust and yet measured um, and rational intelligence um, collection process. And so I've really approached this from, from, two, um, from two perspectives, but I'm also acutely aware that intelligence can serve a human rights agenda. And so that's partly the perspective that I'm speaking from. Um, interestingly, when I was thinking about this topic, I was doing some research on the degree to which espionage generally, but also intelligence gathering, surveillance, et cetera, are regulated by international law. And it's, it's really under-regulated. There's virtually no regulation at all. There may be some rules that we can glean from the Vienna Convention on Diplomacy, for example, on the inviolability of diplomats and of their premises. Um, you have general principles of extraterritoriality, of non-interference, of the sovereign equality of states, of the extraterritorial application of enforcement jurisdiction, limitations on states. Um, but there may also be the flip side, which is that uh, intelligence gathering, forms of espionage, et cetera, may be implicitly authorized by the inherent right of states to self-defense. Um, and so we see that as sort of tacitly authorized under that body of law. And of course, there's a widespread acceptance of the inevitability of various forms of surveillance and, and espionage where we have a lot of, you know, Angela Merkel, who is com complaining about her cell phone. At the same time, was she really surprised that her communications were being monitored by foreign allies? Maybe she was, um, but I think we would be, I think there's some protesting too much that has, had been happening out there in the field, generally, um, with respect to the Snowden revelations. Um, one body of law that actually could offer some constraining norms is international human rights law. Um, there's been a lot of foment within this community as a result of the Snowden revelations and predating those revelations about the scope of um, the surveillance and authorities that the United States and other states utilize. Um, and as a result of some of this energy, we've had a series of reactions by this community and by the multilateral, by multilateral agencies generally. So there's a General Assembly resolution that has been adopted by consensus on the right to privacy in the digital era. And the real contribution of this resolution is the statement that rights that we possess in the physical world, we also possess in the virtual world. Um, it also is playing an agenda setting function as we'll see in the human rights. Sorry, the Human Rights um, Council will be considering this issue as well as the General Assembly in the future. Um, there's been talk of amending the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to more directly address international and virtual rights to privacy. Two special rapporteurs have been concerned with this, the Special Rapporteur on the Prote Protection and Promotion of Human Rights and Counterterrorism Operations, and also on Freedom of Expression and Opinion. Both have weighed in on this issue. Um, and the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights has issued a data call to civil society, to states, to multilateral organizations to get best practices and to start thinking about this. She'll be producing a report, which will then also be fed into various multilateral organizations. The United Kingdom has already been subject to suit before the European Court of Human Rights with respect to their data collection um, exercises by an organization appropriately called Big Brother Watch, which I think has to be one of the best NGO names ever. Um, all respect to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which almost has a great, has a great title as well. Um, and then a number of... I'm an expert in the case, so I can... Oh, okay. Great. You can say what you can say. Um, and a number of NGOs, including Cindy's, have issued 13 principles that should be guiding this. So there's been a lot of energy in this. Um, so there's four dimensions that we can think about um, the way in which human rights, a human rights regime might regulate surveillance. Because I'm the first 
speaker, I thought I'd sort of set these out a little bit and then I think others can weigh in with more detail. So the first would be the formulation of the substantive right. The second would be authorized limitations on that right that states may possess. The third would be the geographic reach, um, as Sharon mentioned in her introduction, in terms of extraterritorial versus domestic conduct. And the fourth would be venues for enforcement. So reaching, starting with the substantive rights, I'm going to focus on the ICCPR only because that's one of the few um, treaties that the United States is subject to that has rights to privacy. But really, the right to privacy is articulated in almost all of the omnibus human rights treaties. With the exception, interestingly enough, of the African Charter does not include an express right to privacy. But we can also think about the implicated rights as a whole constellation of rights, free expression, um, thought, sanctity of the home and of correspondence, the right to receive and impart information, and rights of association. And as Julia mentioned, in Europe, they also conceptualize these rights much more broadly even as rights to personality, as rights to self-determination, as rights even to dignity. And I think this was clear in President Obama's remarks when he, he specifically referenced the dignity of um, our own citizens, but also citizens of our allied and other states. The right to privacy is not articulated as a blanket protection, however. There are um, justified reasons that states can invade that right, and so that's where the fight ends up being in many of these human rights bodies and courts. So in the ICCPR, only unlawful and arbitrary interferences to the rights of, to, to privacy are barred. Free speech protections are subject to clawback clauses that say they must be um, Restrictions can be allowed if they're provided by law, if they're necessary to respect the rights or reputations of others, or if they're necessary to protect national security. And so the way these bodies view this is, has there been an, an interference? This tends to be interpreted quite broadly. Um, so even just the mere collection of information, even if it's not used for any purpose that has harmful impacts on the individual, that in and of itself can constitute a violation. Was it in accordance with law? It's the second inquiry. And this is... Um, at the most simple level, is, is the particular authority authorized by law? A very simple question of does the domestic law authorize it or was this ultra vires? But there are also inquiries as to whether or not the collection authority has the indicia of law more broadly, and that in, involves situations or an inquiry of things like transparency. Do individuals have a certain degree of notice of when they might be subject to this collection authority? Is there a remedy for overreaches? Is there, are there protections and oversight for, to sort of cabin unfettered discretion on the part of the collecting agency? So that's in accordance with law. Thirdly, was the interference with the right pursuant to a legitimate aim? So national security, public safety, the prevention of crime, et cetera. And then you have a sort of amorphous and vague proportionality requirement. Was, was the interference proportional to this aim? Um, and here states are granted some degree of a margin of appreciation um, in terms of articulating that, that proportionality. Then we come to the question of scope, and this is the issue of extraterritoriality. Um, the precise language of the ICCPR is somewhat enigmatic. It's open to multiple interpretations, and all of them are somewhat plausible, both when you look at the text and when you look at the legislative history of the treaty. The United States has long taken a position that the ICCPR only applies to individuals who are both in the territory of the United States and subject to United States jurisdiction. All of the human rights bodies have interpreted that formulation somewhat differently as a disjunctive one, which is to say either individuals within our territory or subject to United States jurisdiction. And so in this context, we are forced to grapple with the question of whether or not surveilling individuals collecting emails, even for the purposes of conducting a, a more targeted search on that collected body of, of digital information, is that sub, are those individuals subject to the jurisdiction of the United States such that it would trigger our obligations under the ICCPR? There's also a further reading which is um, that disaggregates the obligation that says if the question is whether or not the state is respecting those rights, in other words, the state is potentially violating those rights, that applies to wherever the state would be acting, essentially follow state actors, versus ensuring those rights, which in the lexicon of international human rights means protection against invasion by others. And so this is where private actors like the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera, of the world, and this was brought up earlier today, are also gathering this information and using it for their own purposes. And that doesn't always get the same attention as government actors do. Um, and finally, the, the final dimension is really that of, of enforcement. Um, the United States is not subject to any human rights body with real strong enforcement powers, but it does take its human rights obligations very seriously. 
It sends enormous delegations to the Geneva when its, um, its compliance with the ICCPR is under question. And it works collaboratively with allies who are subject to the European Convention on Human Rights, where there is a very robust enforcement regime that is to the, human, inter, the European Court of Human Rights. And so to a certain degree, in order to ensure interoperability and the ability to work collectively with our allies, we often need to, to um, constrain ourselves and to fit within the European system. We see this in the international humanitarian law context, and I think we're also seeing it in this context. So it's not clear under all of this to what extent the NSA's practices and policies and authorities um, are consistent with the ICCPR and with other human rights obligations. And it really, a lot of this turns on this question of jurisdiction, whether individuals who's, whose emails are being collected for whatever purpose are within the jurisdiction. Um, the Germany's system has been subject to analysis in the Weber, Weber and Saravia versus um, Germany case, and actually their system was found to be within compliance. And so human rights bodies are not necessarily running amok in terms of de declaring you know, every system that they look at as being overly expansive. Um, I think when we're dealing with targeted intellig intelligence gathering where there's probable cause or a reasonable articulable suspicion of you know, engaging in something that would harm national security or a crime, I think it's relatively easy to justify it. Um, when you're dealing with hostile states, I think it's relatively easy. It's harder to justify when you're dealing with something that approaches a mass surveillance of ordinary individuals. And so this is where we have to really work on finding the right balance. Um, and I think understanding the technological capabilities and understanding what those authorities cover is really important. I think the last panel was great on that in terms of giving us a better sense. So I'll stop there and um, we can continue the conversation during the Q&A. Thank you. Chris? Thank you. Um, I, I joined with everyone who's come before in thanking Stanford for establishing the venue, a very important dialogue. And hopefully this will continue not simply across this day, but across the foreseeable uh, future. Um, the great question, um, essentially, in, in, in my uh, characterization, devolves to how do we affect security and privacy? I don't think that uh, we're being asked to make um, an unholy choice between those two for whom, and how do we then, at the end of the day, guarantee that? Um, I think at NSA, even before Mr. Snowden uh, came out and, and we became much more visible, uh, much more well known, um, we have described in our own view that if, if you don't bake those two in, um, trying to guarantee both security and privacy um, at the beginning, um, and in every facet of what you do, you couldn't possibly bolt them on at the end. Um, in so much as we used to give some presentations, even in the public domain, about how to affect security and privacy, and as opposed to the traditional way of showing the kind of scales of justice, where you say if you kind of trade one off, you necessarily would get one or the other, or vice versa, we said that's an inappropriate metaphor. But the better metaphor is to have two rails under a car, a train, and that both of those rails aren't sitting on a solid foundation. If they're not both straight and true, you can't guarantee either in the car. That's the point. <laughs> the governance and the affectation of the constitutional principles simply won't work. I think that's the better way to look at it. Um, I actually like the European context where they talk about how to then affect that, uh, that proposition um, through the application of principles called necessity and proportionality and think that the United States in the execution of its own um, approach gets close to the same place. We're probably in the same neighborhood, not necessarily at the same house. Um, so again, to remind the European Human Rights Convention in Article 8 would say that it is sometimes appropriate um, for security to encroach upon privacy, but it must do so um, using the standards of necessity and only proportionate to that necessity. The United States comes at it in a slightly different vein. The United States would first and foremost remind itself, and, and at NSA, I never forget the first conversation I had with a lawyer the day I was introduced to operations. Um, he talked first and foremost about the Tenth Amendment, which I'd never heard of. Um, I actually guess I had, but, but not by name. Um, I thought he might want to talk about the Fourth Amendment, um, or the very ever popular First Amendment, sometimes the Second Amendment, but it was the Tenth Amendment. He said, remember, the Tenth Amendment says, unless it's been explicitly granted to you as an authority, you don't have it. Right? If it doesn't say that you can do it, you cannot. Um, you therefore, first and foremost, need to remember as a federal um, employee, as a member of the executive branch, you need to actually be able to pin what you do on some explicit um, expectation, some explicit delegation of what you'll achieve, and it needs to be constrained to that and no more. Um, which means then that when NSA thinks about how it applies its authorities, as first and foremost, think about what's the explicit grantor of those authorities. Those authorities always come with constraints and controls applied. 
That's why it was so very disappointing in the middle of June when the first thing that was released by Mr. Snowden and the bevy of reporters was the secondary order, which simply said you can have access to this material um, from Verizon, but presumably other companies. Um, when it was the primary order that actually specified to a much greater length what the expectations were, what the authorities were, what the controls and constraints that went hand in glove with those authorities might be. So that's the first thing, and that's very important. The second thing that happens in the U.S. system, in a particular place like NSA, is that thus, that there, there thus must be um, an expectation or a specification of priorities. Right? So the authorities would say that you can, within um, a reasonably wide envelope, um, pursue something of interest, um, here's the authority, here are the controls, constraints on that authority, and then the executive branch says, and here are the priorities. Um, and so the kind of authority might be that you can pursue foreign intelligence, and you can certainly mean, you can use certain means and methods. And the controls, constraints would be to kind of say, here are the points patched which you can't go. You may not collect this kind of material, you may not collect this kind of material on certain individuals, but then the priorities within that would say, what's more important than um, other things? So it might be that Al Qaeda, within the realm of terrorism, is the most important thing ever, um, and that you know three terrorists and a small dog operating in some godforsaken country on the kind of edge of the um, arc of instability is the least important thing. Um, but those priorities are very, very finely segregated. Um, and NSA, on a regular basis, on an annual basis, gets upwards of about twenty-five thousand pages of requirements. Um, and they're in explicit priority order, such that it is very clear which of the things is most important, which of the things is least important, um, which at the end of the day, you know, has a cultural effect of um, essentially um, disincentivizing us to pursue things that are either A, not authorized, or B, not um, prioritized, um, because if we worked anything that wasn't um, on one of those two things, we would clearly be found wanting um, in our performance reviews at the end of the year. Um, the other things I would add is that the sum of those authorities and priorities um, kind of ultimately describe um, that there's a need to protect innocence of any nationality. Um, we haven't talked in this room about it, but there have been um, instances across the last 10 years where NSA employees have on about a dozen occasions misused the SIGINT system, actually applied its, um, its capabilities to pursue something that they shouldn't. Uh, more often than not, it was a person known to the individual who misused the system, and more often than not, they wanted to find out something about whether what they told them in a private relationship was true in the conduct of their public affairs. What's less well known is just about all of them, I think with one exception, all of those persons um, against whom the system was misused were foreign persons. Um, and it was sufficiently serious to us that any misuse of the system um, has to be dealt with, that we dealt with them all the same way. Um, everyone lost their clearance. The military persons have um, additional um, things that we can do, reduction in grade, forfeiture of pay. Um, but, but that's a pretty serious consequence for somebody working in the national security system for the single mistake they made across the thousands of days that they might have worked within that system. Um, it's a very rare event, um, sufficiently rare, that um, it's twice as likely you'll die for NSA. 22 people have essentially lost their lives in harm's way working for NSA um, as to you'll make a mistake. But I hasten to point out that those mistakes apply broadly um, to the protection of innocence of any nationality or strike. The, the last thing I will mention in that regard is that the burden is continuous. Um, so it's not a burden that says that we have to affect um, those authorities and those priorities in a way that achieves, I think, naturally um, necessity and proportionality at one moment in time, and at that moment we're then free and clear to do whatever we want with what we, we get. Um, but it's in the construct of the collection system, it's in the construct of the tasking within that collection system, it's in the construct of the mechanisms that hold the data, allow query of the data, analysis, sifting of the data, and ultimately reporting and dissemination of that data. Um, if there are certain burdens about how to protect innocents, and in particular Americans have a distinguished um, set of protections under the Constitution, those things um, essentially are continuous burdens that are never removed, such that if at any moment in the process you discover that you've in fact made a mistake, you need to go back and actually um, remove, purge, all the way back to the point where you're clean again. Um, so it can't be that you accept the fruit of the poison tree and then proceed from that further. Um, I'd like to defer most of the questions then, um, not so much to a monologue up front, and therefore I'll keep my remarks short. I'd only like to say two more things. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, what we think we try to achieve at NSA is an appropriate effect, effectation or effectation of security and privacy. Um, but I think that what's been missing in that is the third leg of the stool, which is sufficient transparency for those who essentially make the judgment as to whether we've got the right um, implementation of that to judge that we, in fact, are in the right place. 
Um, I think that in many cases we've had to bypass Congress given the inflammation within the private sector, the public sector. Um, I think much of that has been unfair, um, even scurrilous. Um, but, but that said, we have to first win back, I think, the confidence of the American public. We also have to win back the confidence of allies with whom we do much of this work. Um, and ultimately, we have to get back to a place where those who stand in their shoes, whether it's a Privacy and Civil Liberties Board, whether it's the Congress, whether it's overseers in the executive branch, that they have the close in review. Um, to them, we are maximally transparent so that they can then turn around and say with some confidence that we think this is in the right place. Last thing I would say is that this is really hard to do given all of the kind of exhortations by overseers that NSA has of we should never again suffer a terrorist attack on American soil in a world where there's a very dynamic set of threats and where individuals have enormous power to do things that they couldn't possibly have done 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but that having been said, it's going to be harder still when cyber threats come of age. I think if you think that you know it's difficult enough to figure out who's who in the zoo with respect to terrorism, the iconic threat, um, it's going to be much, much harder in the cyber world, which I think is going to motivate us um, to essentially achieve a greater degree of transparency and a greater international approach to this, um, because it can't work any other way. When you begin to think, think of cyber threats, which largely are attributable to anonymous entities in that space and almost always occur in the neutral zone. And so it's very difficult based upon geography or some attribution to some foreign national or national identity uh, to describe what are the rules that are appropriate to apply to this particular situation. They're almost indescribable and, describable, and therefore it's going to have to be a much more collaborative effort. Thank you. Uh, Beth? Sure. Uh, Beth number two on the panel. I have to <laughs> confess, I've, I don't think I've ever been on a panel with another Beth. So, nice. yes, it is lovely. Um, and I'll add my thanks to the organizers and extrapolating from my own experience. I can only imagine what an exercise in cat herding this must have been for them. So I, I commend the organizers and I'm excited to be a part of this. So um, I am a member of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. This board is an independent executive branch agency. It is actually um, a fulfillment of a recommendation of the 9-11 Commission. And I noticed that this conference was in part designed to look at the 9-11 Commission 10 years later. So my board is the third iteration of a privacy oversight board. The first was an intra-agency um, executive branch Board. Uh, the second iteration was a, a creature of Congress, um, but only two members were subject to Senate confirmation and it was placed in the executive office of the president. So it was essentially a White House board. It was viewed to be insufficiently independent. In 2007, um, as part of the 9-11 Recommendations Act, uh, Congress created the board of which I am now a member. So it is an independent executive branch agency. It has a full-time chairman and four uh, part-time members. I am one of the part-time members. All of us are subject to um, Senate confirmation. Uh, our mandate is to provide advice and oversight with respect to actions taken by the United States government to protect against terror. And our mandate is a balancing one, to look at the need for any given action and to ensure that privacy and civil liberties are being taken into account as the government proceeds with this action. So in answer to the question that was posed at the end of the last panel, what is the body that is looking not just at the legality of actions, but also the policy implications of actions and whether they are justified as a policy matter? That is the board of which I am a, a member, and clearly we need to do a little more advertising on that, what, what our function is. So we have the ability, we all have TSSEI, the highest clearances. We have the ability to request information. Um, thus far, we have been um, universally welcomed within the executive branch in terms of requests for information. Um, again, we are focused on actions taken by the United States gov government. That said, um, and I think all of the members are unanimous, we hope we do not get to this point. We do have the authority to request the Attorney General to subpoena private actors to provide information. So one could imagine, for example, in a situation that involves um, private parties operating under court order or some other situation, we could get there. I think each of us, though, is, is very hesitant to go there as our mandate really is executive branch. 
facing. Um, by the terms of our statute, we are expected and required to operate publicly where we can. One of our greatest values, we think, is to provide public education about the activities of the executive branch in the counterterrorism effort. We are subject to reporting requirements. If called to testify before Congress, we must testify before Congress, which we have done. Um, and we are subject both under our organic statute um, to holding public hearings, but also we are subject to the Sunshine Act, which means that we must, to the extent possible, consistent with our national security mandate, meet in public and act in public as a board. Um, although the law was passed in 2007, um, Congress uh, was somewhat uh, recalcitrant about appointing the members to the board, excuse me, about confirming those members to the board. Um, it was not until August of 2012 that the four part-time members of the board began service. Uh, due to a quirk in the statute, we could not hire staff. Only our chairman, who was not yet appointed, could hire staff. So much of our first year was devoted to doing wonderful things like um, releasing the warrant, which I had no idea of what that meant. And it took four members, all of whom have advanced degrees, and three separate agencies of the United States government to figure out that meant the Treasury Department telling us where our bank account was, essentially. So um, we spent a lot of time working on standing up the agency, and it is a lesson in how not to write a law. Um, it was a reaction to the perception of the previous board being insufficiently independent that we were thrown to the wolves and, you know, good luck, go, go start an agency. So uh, in May of 20, that, that said, we did uh, embark upon our mission and we identified three areas. Uh, one was the uh, Attorney General guidelines in 2012 governing the National Counterterrorism Center. In those 2012 guidelines, the Attorney General, under certain circumstances, authorized NCTC to acquire on a bulk basis databases from other agencies that were not primarily counterterrorism. So this was a significant step and a significant shift, um, and that was an area that we were focused on beginning uh, at, at the beginning of our operations. Second was the reauthorization of the FISA Amendments Act. We've talked here about Section 702 and the 702 program, so we were looking at the 702 program. Uh, the third were the Attorney General guidelines for domestic FBI operations, which were promulgated in 2008, and the implementation of those uh, guidelines by the FBI. Uh, in May of 2013, our chairman was at long last confirmed, and then Mr. Snowden uh, began leaking our most sensitive uh, counterterrorism and foreign intelligence operations, which changed somewhat the focus of our board. Um, we agreed to look at the Section 215 program. So this is the telephony metadata program that has been discussed um, by various panelists and previous panels, as well as the Section 702 program, one aspect of which is known as PRISM. Uh, we, in January of this year, after a series of briefings and public hearing, um, including uh, testimony by Mr. Jaffer, who you will hear from later, uh, we, my board issued a report on the Section 215 program and the operations of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, the board unanimously recommended certain interim changes to the operations of the Section 215 program, including narrowing the retention period for records that were obtained pursuant to that program. And also, we've heard talk of the reasonable articulable suspicion, and I'm not sure I've heard anyone say it yet, but the hops, but the number of records really that you could acquire pursuant to any one query based on reasonable articulable suspicion. Our recommendation was that instead of three hops, the, the um, NSA limit to two hops. Um, we also unanimously recommended um, increased participation of a uh, special advocate in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which you heard about also in the last panel. We encouraged um, 
the FISC judges to draft significant opinions in such a way as to be capable of declassification and being made public, as well as a retrospective review of significant uh, opinions for declassification purposes, understanding two factors. One, these opinions were not ever written with the intention that they would become public, and it's very difficult to declassify something in that way. And second, the resource allocations, it's the same people who have to do the declassification review as who would be doing the current operation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, there, were, there was one non-unanimous recommendation, which was to shut the program down. Uh, that was a three to, uh, burying the lead right there. Uh, that was a three to vote. Um, the conclusion of the majority of the board was that the uh, program lacked statutory authorization and uh, the effectiveness of the program did not justify its ongoing operation. We are now looking at section 702 uh, and I think that there you do see um, some of the issues really that have come up in the last two speakers, which is certainly the implications for non-US persons um, with 702 collection. Section 7 of FISA itself makes a strong dis distinction between US persons and non-US persons within the statute. It is a statutory distinction. If you look at 702, which governs overseas, or excuse me, collection directed at non-US persons reasonably believed to be overseas. There are sections 703, 704, which also talk about collection about US persons. So the statute itself makes this distinction. Um, at our hearing about 702, we did hear a significant amount of testimony about the ICCPR and the potential implications for the ICCPR. But what I would say on this point, and I think this is consistent with what the President said in conjunction with issuing um, Presidential Directive 28 is that you know, my inquiry, certainly, the inquiry of the board is not limited to whether or not there is a legal obligation to afford certain treatment to non-US persons. The question for us as well is what are the policy implications of the treatment of non-US persons and what are the justifications for differential treatment between US persons and non-US persons? And we will be a part of the process of implementing PPD 28, which speaks to that very issue. Um, and I am being told to conclude. And guess what? I just got to the last <laughs> thing that I wanted to say. So there we are. Thank you. Cindy. Hi. Um, so um, I'm not quite sure where to start here. This is a very different kind of event than the, what I thought I was coming uh, to. Um, because it really hasn't involved anybody uh, uh, outside of government or academia until me um, <laughs> and Jamil uh, after this. Um, so um, it's difficult. I, I guess I'd like to say a couple of things. One is I'm very pleased to hear. Uh, so let me tell you what I've been doing first. My name is Cindy Cohen. I'm the legal director of EFF. We have been engaged in trying to get an adversarial process by which the United States federal district courts and then the courts on up decide whether mass surveillance is constitutional or legal under the statutes uh, since uh, early 2006. Um, the government has changed the hats under which it has conducted mass surveillance over that time. Currently, I think the leading uh, contenders are Section 215 of the Patriot Act for the uh, telephone Records Collection, Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which was passed in 2008, so two years after we started suing, uh, for uh, uh, another program called the Upstream Program, uh, I believe is what they call it, although what I call it is the fiber optic splitter that's installed in the major peering stations of large telecommunications companies across the country, such that a copy of everybody's communications that goes through those peering stations goes into NSA control. Um, that was a little more technical, um, but I'm hoping people follow me. I'm happy to follow that up. Um, that's what we've been suing about since 2006, this uh, a, a copy being made of everybody's communications at central switching stations with one copy going to the NSA and the other copy going to its destination. We have specific evidence about one of these installations on the Folsom Street AT&T building in downtown San Francisco, but the schematics that we have that were brought to us, Mr. Snowden was not the first whistleblower, that were brought to us 
from a whistleblower in 2006 indicate that this, this similar installation happens in, in major places across the country. So we've been trying to bring individual accountability, individual rights into this conversation for eight years now. Um, and I will say that the mechanisms for accountability uh, for your constitutional rights with regard to your government getting custody of your communications and communications records are wanting. We have been met with obstacles every single step of the way trying to get this question. For the first several years, it was the state secrets privilege uh, that was never accepted by any of the courts that looked at this question, but nonetheless tied us up and down the Ninth Circuit several times. Um, um, we, we faced qualified immunities, we faced all sorts of, of obstacles. And so I think to the extent that this body is interested in are there mechanisms for individual accountability with regard to an adversarial process inside the third branch of government, the answer is so far working really hard at it eight years in. Um, and I haven't given up yet, but uh, the idea that this is an accountability mechanism as it would be, say, if you were facing discrimination or any other kinds of problems with your government, this branch of government has not been made available to individuals for purposes of seeking the, even the question of whether this is constitutional or not. This is important to me because I think that the secret processes that have happened um, now that they have been revealed somewhat, have been found to be a little shaky. Um, I think that the argument that Section 215 of the Patriot Act authorizes mass metadata collection doesn't even pass the giggle test in terms of a fair reading of that statute. And I've written briefs on this, Jamil's written briefs on this, but honestly, it's a fair question at a minimum and one that we should be able to raise. But it wasn't raised. This was all done secretly in a one-sided process, and we're seeing bits and pieces of the legal analysis now. And frankly, I think this analysis could have benefited from an adversarial process and multiple judges who really were empowered to look over the shoulders of the next one, and maybe even appellate review. I was glad to hear that mentioned earlier. Um, I think similarly, section the idea that Section 702 authorizes mass collection. 702 is a statute that talks about targeting. It doesn't talk about what happens before the targeting. It talks about targeting. This country did not decide that millions of people ought to be surveilled on the way to the people that the national intelligence community or the FBI wanted. This is a major shift, and I would argue, and I've been trying to argue, that this is a shift that has constitutional dimension, and it has it in two places uh, constitutionally that are easy to see. I actually think there's a third one. There's a due process problem here as well. But the two that we talk about the most are the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution was written in the context of a particular problem. And that problem was non-specific warrants. The idea that uh, they were called general warrants or writs of assistance, the idea that a warrant could be issued based upon a crime that then empowered the colonial, uh, the, the, the British troops to then search whichever homes they wanted because this crime had happened resulted very directly, this is like 10th grade civics, right, resulted very directly in the Fourth Amendment, which said you had to have a particularized warrant upon probable cause in order for the government, not based upon what they found when they went inside your house, but based on whether they got to go into your house in the first place to seek what they might find. I think that there is a constitutional question about mass surveillance under the Fourth Amendment, whether it's consistent with, the, with general warrants. And it's one that we deserve to have as a country before we decide we're just going to throw this out the window because we're all real scared about terrorism. Or today, what did I hear in addition to terrorism we had to worry about? We had to worry about theft of IP. We had to worry about uh, fake drugs. We had to worry about human trafficking. We had to worry about diseases, all of which the intelligence community is now being asked to do. Uh, in addition to the very narrow uh, uh, brief that it had before. Um, then the second one I want to talk about is the First Amendment, because it doesn't get talked about nearly as much, and I'm a big fan of it, uh, which is the questions about right of association. Now, the statutes that allow, that the government is using, do mention the First Amendment, but they say that the First Amendment, they only stop investigations predicated solely on First Amendment activity. And I would argue that that's not very, that's pretty cold comfort for most people because any investigator worth their salt can come up with something else in addition to First Amendment activity. Um, and since it all happens in secret, we don't really get to see to do it. And I don't think, so I don't think solely is a sufficient standard under the First Amendment, even if you would argue that the statute does take the First Amendment into account somewhat, I don't think it does it enough. But more importantly, I think, is the First Amendment 
as itself protects the right of association. And this is really important for purposes of what I think a lot of the intelligence community is trying to do. They're trying to map people's associations. They're trying to figure out who talks to who. They're trying to figure out how these communities work. Some of them are communities that are terrorists. Some of them are communities that just happen to be a Muslim population in New York City, right? But, but the whole point of the way that they're going about this is to try to track the associations. And this tells me, as a First Amendment lawyer, which is how I started in this, that there is a level of scrutiny that the Constitution requires be applied to this activity. And it's called strict scrutiny. And we know what those rules are. And they require a very tight fit between the means and the end. And I don't think mass surveillance that scoops up tons and tons of people who are not even remotely targets of the investigation for purposes of triggering the right of association meets strict scrutiny. But I would submit to you that we deserve an answer from an adversarial court to these questions. And they can't be just brushed under the rug in our day and age. Um, I want to say a couple more things. Those are so that's the center. Those are the centerpieces of the cases. I've got one case called First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles versus the NSA, which focuses on these First Amendment issues. My clients in these cases are 23 associations that organize for social change. They range from the California Gun Owners Association to People for the American Way to Students for Sensible Drug Policy. I will tell you, these organizations agree on nothing except that they have the right to gather together and make their voices heard. And if the US government has ongoing access to their communications records, it will scare people out of joining their campaigns. And they have evidence of this that we've put in the record. Um, and the second one is Jewel versus NSA, which is the inheritor of the case we started in 2006, which was against AT&T and got blocked by a congressional action, it was relaunched in 2008. Um, involving a uh, class action of AT&T customers talking about the collection of their phone records and the, the fiber optic splitter that I told you about. So those are the two cases we're doing. The EFF does much more than that. Those are the two things that take up most of my time. Um, as, as Beth number one mentioned, uh, we've been involved with a bunch of other organizations. Now there are well over 400 organizations worldwide who have signed on to these 13 principles. They're called the Necessary and Proportionate Principles, which I'll tell you my comms team hates that name. Uh, but it is actually referencing the international human rights standards for how you think about surveillance. Um, and uh, talking about this issue, talking about uh, the question of extraterritoriality. It's very interesting because some of what's going on here is new and some is old. Um, some of what's new is that we're shifting having our national, our foreign intelligence powers um, aimed at the United States without, I think, the sufficient level of protections necessary to, to protect uh, that, that, that domestic investigations have to have. Um, and that's kind of a new problem, and it's one after September 11th that came along. One of them is an old problem, I think, which is this distinction that U.S. law takes and the U.S. Constitution takes between U.S. persons and non-U.S. persons. And I think the revelation to the rest of the world um, that, A, we have this distinction, that's not that big a deal, although I think a lot of people were unhappy about it. What they were unhappy, but I, but I don't think actually that's the real problem. And if, you, if you're only thinking about that problem, you're missing it. I think what the rest of the world is really upset about is that the U.S. has developed the, not only the capability, but is actually surveilling masses around the world. Um, and that non-U.S. persons who are not suspect at all are subject to these gigantic dragnets and that their communications are getting swept up too. I think that the raw distinction between U.S. persons and non-U.S. persons, if it was about targeted surveillance, would not be generating the kind of international backlash that we're seeing. It's the mass nature of the surveillance internationally that has the people, people around the world pretty upset. Um, it, that's my bet. Um, we haven't done any work on this. Um, the last thing I want to say, because I know my time is, is doing, is there's been a lot of people inside the intelligence community in this conversation today and people who are defending it, including the entire last panel, which didn't have anybody who disagreed. Um, uh, my great uh, respect for Chris to actually sit here with somebody who disagrees with him. Um, and, um, and I suspect Beth as well on some, some points we disagree. But, um, I think there's a level of groupthink going on among members of the Intelligence Committee that I heard here over and over again. And there's a couple things I'd like to flag that you think about. Um, the first thing is I'm very, very happy to hear people, person after person talk about the need for more transparency. I think underneath that is the idea that if the people around the world and the American people only knew what was actually going on, they'd all feel a lot safer. 
I'll be just perfectly happy with what's going on in the surveillance. And I would submit that you open your mind to the possibility that the American people are pissed off right now because they're finally seeing what you guys are doing, and they're not happy with the lines that you have drawn internally and that you've justified to yourselves over and over again in secret for the last 10 years. Um, so I'm all, fa all in favor of transparency, but I do think that you might be drawing the wrong conclusion um, and that uh, from, from what you're hearing from the American people. And I submit you listen a little more closely and you may hear something different. I also think the other thing is that oversight inside an organization isn't the same thing as oversight with real outside influence. I think, you know, uh, Mr. Fine has done some amazing work and, and I use some of his work in some of the challenges that we've done. But I, and, 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 and so I'm, I'm in favor of inspectors general. I think they are somewhat independent, but these internal checks and balances and stuff, I mean, I, I just think that they're not sufficient and they're not sufficient given the magnitude of what's going on here. Um, and that until these agencies are willing to open themselves up to people other than true believers looking over their shoulder, um, you're not gonna um, get to the place where you need to be. Okay, uh, thank you, and um, uh, I welcome the fact that we now actually, we have a, a, a debate that's already begun. Let me just sharpen a couple of points of disagreement that... Uh, Sharper. <laughs> Good point. Maybe wait till I'm not sure that could get sharper. <laughs> um, clearly, we have some disagreements, both about the technical scope of the surveillance actually taking place, um, in addition to this question of the need for external uh, judicial oversight, apart from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and the adequacy of internal oversight. Um, so I will let maybe Chris start. I imagine sure. that he is um, chomping at the bit to respond, um, and then open it up to the rest of the panel to comment uh, before we uh, turn it over to all of you for q yeah, so, so let me start first as a point of agreement. I, I may or may not surprise you that uh, that I, but I would testify both as an NSA official prior to 2000, January 2014, or as a private citizen afterwards, would welcome um, an adversary at the court um, and possibly even a technology at the court or technologist at the court um, to help the court work its way through what might be all sides of a particular um, debate. I think the question would be how can you make that operationally efficient? Um, but but you know I think that that's welcome and I've heard the court um, say as much as well. Uh, I would simply like to say four things. One, um, I'd like to refute for the record, NSA does not receive a copy of all Americans' communications. Um, simply untrue. Um, two, 702 does not authorize mass surveillance, and nor should it therefore be interpreted or executed to authorize uh, mass surveillance. It's targeted. There are 60-day reviews um, by external entities from NSA. Now, they're within the executive branch, and so that may not be external enough, uh, but they look at every single targeting decision that's made under 702 and make a determination as to whether that was appropriate. Whether the foreignness determination was appropriate, again, um, that may not be completely consistent with the ICCPR. Um, and whether the foreign intelligence expectation was um, appropriate. Three, FAA goes further, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 2008 goes further than its predecessors um, in prohibiting the targeting of U.S. person communications anywhere in the world um, without a court warrant. Turns out before that, before 2008, um, under an attorney general authorization, um, you could in fact target a U.S. person's communications when they were overseas if you had the Attorney General saying that it's appropriate to do so. That's no longer possible. Um, that same law, 2008 law, goes further to say that you may not use a statute, the 702 statute, to do reverse targeting. So you can't um, understand that uh, person A, an American, U.S. person, um, communicates regularly with person B, um, and because you can target B, that's a backdoor to get to target A's communications. You just can't do that. Um, and four, I would say, from a statement of uh, culture, and this is something I can simply assert, but you know, I can appreciate how hard it is to prove, NSA has no equity separate and apart from the United States, the nation's equity. Um, and so if you were to ask an NSA official, and frankly, I believe any IC official, you know, how do you feel about this separate and apart from what might be good for the nation, they would say that question's a non sequitur, that there's no possible answer for that. Then um, if what is good for the nation is what we determine is the way forward, that's what we will do. And everyone who shows up at NSA that I've ever met um, shows up with that view in mind. And the first day, um, to George's point, they take an oath to the Constitution, and I personally give that or gave that um, to everyone that I possibly could, 50 a week. Um, and I would remind them that it was to the whole of the Constitution, not just the national security component. Don't be misled by the fact that an official from the executive branch is giving you this oath. 
or that our names is national security. It's everything in that Constitution. And if they were to find us doing anything that um, inappropriately violated any aspect of that, they need to hold up their hand. I take the point that they you sometimes are kind of myopically focused on the name of your organization, national security, and the threats to the nation that kind of are clear and, and, um, and, and relevant in front of you, and you therefore have the opportunity to run afoul of that through um, good and noble effort, and that's why external review and perhaps adversarial review is appropriate. I accept that, embrace that, and would welcome that. Wish you were still in office. Yes, sir. How would you fix beginning of the, the core defect? Me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I do think that the USA Freedom Act is not a bad place to start. There are, this is the Leahy Sensenbrenner bill, Sensenbrenner wrote Section 215 and turned around and said, boy, I never meant it to do that. Um, uh, is is actually a pretty nice collection. I think that the language needs to be tightened up a little bit around bulk surveillance because I don't think it's actually um, will do the job. Be, um, um, but I think that that's a doable goal. Um, and the the act has a, a a process in it for an adversarial system within the the FISC that I think is a good start. Honestly, I'm not an expert in how to do that. There are other people who could probably do it more often, but. I am a big fan of adversarial processes. I also think that the barriers to bringing things in front of the regular district courts are important. You know, the FISC just issued a decision about destruction of evidence. In my case, a case that I've been having in front of Judge White since 2008, because the government didn't tell them that my case was still pending. And it turns out that they've made this, um, frankly, ridiculous interpretation of my complaint without checking in with me and based upon that made a representation to the FISC. Now it's nice that the FISC is starting to, to be a little more transparent because I found out that this was happening but we had to rush in for a TRO in order to do this and I was technically held to be an amicus in the FISC for purposes of trying to get that court to stop the destruction of evidence in my case. So to me this is a classic example of how if you only hear from one side you know, I mean, I don't think the FISC is, would indict a ham sandwich. That's the classic statement about grand juries. But if you only hear from one side, you're not going to, and, you, and the one side is trying to win. And make no mistake about it, the Justice Department wants, they want their request granted, then you're not getting the full picture. You're never getting the full picture. And I, I so, I, you know, how to actually fix that, I think an adversarial process I actually don't know that many of these things have to happen in the FISC. I actually think that federal district courts can handle this without the kind of crazy FISC stuff where I have to email a Department of Justice attorney in order to get my stuff to, uh, you know, I've handled national security cases in the regular federal district courts and I, I don't find them to be wanting in terms of the secrecy stuff. I mean, sometimes it's frustrating for other things. So um, I'm not a big fan of the FISA court even before. Its operations got so expanded um, you know, when the FISA court was originally, I mean, I, I feel funny talking to you, Judge Carr, because you know this, but let me, for everybody else, when the FISA court was first put into place, it was doing very narrow things that were like approving warrants, um, and only in a national security context. Um, now the FISA court is called upon to really run roughshod over agencies over a very complicated process involving algorithmic, you know, uh, searching through massive amounts of information, um, ongoing searches in a very complicated way. I think getting them technical support, which I did not mention, but I forgot to, is tremendously important, and getting them somebody who can really help them evaluate it. But I'm not sure they should be operating as a kind of administrative oversight agency over something as big as the foreign intelligence surveillance activities have grown from when they were first started. Um, and I do submit that it's very different than a regular you know, war regular warrants get approved in a, in a ex parte process, there's only one side, but there are far more checks down the line, including the possibility of a suppression or the evidence getting kicked out that don't exist in the FISC process. And I think, uh, so, so while, you know, so I don't think it's a very good analogy because even if a warrant is granted and it's improper, there are many opportunities down the road for the other side to figure out what's happening and move to suppress or take other actions to get it thrown out and, so, and it may even be a different judge and, and none of those ha really, they don't, they don't have teeth in the FISC 
context. So anyway. Yeah. I'd actually like to get uh, just a, a comment from Beth, uh, too, on that point, because the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to put you on the spot, but did take a, a look at the FISC court, uh, and, and to my recollection, those uh, recommendations were unanimous. Mm -hmm. um, but the reforms proposed were more in the lines of making it more adversarial through, for example, a public advocate, but not nearly so much as, you know, essentially, uh, but, or, but essentially the, the, uh, the uh, board approved the general role of the FISC court in, in undertaking more programmatic-based reviews, which is you know, the kind of role that um, Cindy was just objecting to. So, so what was the board's thinking on um, having a FISC court um, undertake reviews of programmatic surveillance in a way that it, it hadn't, say, in the post-1978 period? So I think the, the board did not recommend changes that would um, shift any type of judicial oversight for these type of programmatic um, authorities from the FISC either to a district court or I, I mean, I, I do question whether if you believe in judicial oversight, a single district court judge um, would do a better job of programmatic oversight than the, the FISC and perhaps that's not what you were indicating, but the the recommendations that the board made um, were, I believe, fourfold. Um, one was to develop a set, a, a body of attorneys with expertise in civil rights, civil liberties, national security, have the highest clearances, and be essentially on call to the extent that, and we did use Rule 11 as the touchstone if you had a particularly novel um, or interesting application and um, also potentially uh, renewal. And that we, this would not be purely a prospective recommendation, but also renewals of ongoing programs to the extent they raise some of the same questions. We did talk about also the ability for that advocate also to seek um, appellate review. Uh, there are standing questions. The FISC itself is anomalous constitutionally, and then when you add in standing to seek appellate review, uh, it becomes even more complicated. Um, we look to uh, analogs such as bankruptcy court or the certification process under 1292B um, and recommended something akin to the certification process that the special advocate could in fact seek both um, a FISC, FISCAR, there is a FISA court of review um, and also the Supreme Court. We recommended that the FISC court make more use of its ability to bring in technologists. In our view, they have that authority already. I think there's a split of opinion as to that, but we did think that that is authority they have and they should continue to use because what you see time and time again is a horrible game of telephone where a technologist is describing what the system can do to a lawyer who then describes it to a lawyer who then describes it to a judge and it turns out in fact what is actually happening in good faith is not at all what was described to the court or approved by the court and so trying to find a way to make sure that the lines of communications are better and then also to the point of having public discussions about what it is that our agencies are doing and are authorized to do by the judicial branch, having uh, more of an emphasis on open um, aspects of proceedings. And I think we were careful to say with each of our transparency recommendations that they cheat the government should act transparently to the maximum extent possible consistent with national security. So we had a range of recommendations, but none of which um, would, I think, be fairly read to say that the FISA court should not be involved in programmatic um, surveillance authorizations. Just, just a quick clarification. Mm -hmm. I mean, the FISA court is just a single district court judge most of the time. Um, but it's and when it's it actually to the Judge Carr's point, it has sat a monk before. In, in 2001, I believe it, it does not happen frequently. What they did for the wall, for the, right, yes. Not that I'm aware of, which is one reason why we've indicated that there should be some opportunity for appellate review, which is, I think, actually the traditional function of a court of appeals is to bring a second set of eyes or a more collaborative effort, not 
a district court, as far as I am aware, does not sit on bunk as a general matter. Well, so, Not bad. I'd be happy to me and and um, actually, EFF has much smarter people than me. We'd be happy to have a discussion with you about uh, some of those. Uh, but I do think that I mean I think we're all trying to get to the same goal. And then the question is like the you know the devil's in the details about how you get there. The reason that I am uncomfortable with the Fisk. Well, first of all, it is just a single district court judge most of the time, and we pretend like it's not. And I think that disconnect is something we ought to be clear about. And then the. And then, and, and, and the other thing is, of course, there, it's a subset of district court judges that are selected by the sitting chief of the Supreme Court as opposed to the broad range of judges. So I'm okay with it. Maybe you might want to have a narrower category, but the idea that a certain percentage of them have to live near Washington, D.C., so it means that judges in the West are really not very well represented, and the, 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 I think the image of these people all being selected by whoever happens to be the chief judge of the Supreme Court is not a pretty image for most Americans and who want to think that there's a basic fairness about what's going on here. It doesn't feel fair. And, um, and I don't mean to you know, disparage. I think there's a lot of really good judges sitting on the fisc, but it's, you know, we have a process by which people get to be judges. And why are we picking this weird subset to get to decide these cases? Um, I don't, I think it, it strikes people as unfair. So that's, when I talk about getting rid of the FISC, those are the kinds of values that I'm talking about, about why I think the FISC is, is problematic, quite apart from the secrecy. I mean, you know, look, federal district courts handle cases with, with the Classified Information Procedures Act and other things. There may be, there may need to be some processes put in place to make that easier, because I think they're kind of difficult for the courts to handle. But, um, but I don't like, uh, there are lots of things about the way the FISC is structured now that I think strike people as crazy and, and, and unfair. And, and so trying to think about those in addition to getting appellate review and independent stuff ought to be part of a package. Right. Let me okay. say it was Thank you. Oh. If I may. Final comment on this, and then I want to make sure we get to questions. Here it is time. 
So uh, I'm not sure who was next. Uh, okay, so Professor Weiner. So Tom, uh, Thomas Hines' paper basically says that acquisition need not be directed at a particular facility and therefore could be directed at a series of phone numbers, e.g. all the numbers from the Pashtun region of Pakistan or a series of IP addresses of a particular internet company. And I'm hearing a disagreement between the two of you, you are. about whether it's targeted or not. Right, so, so you can't put, you cannot put a wild card in there if you want an answer to the question, which that would imply that you can put a wild card in there. You need to actually determine what each and every one of those phone numbers well, is. Let me, let me just ask more of the general question rather than the specific. That's the specific answer. Okay, I don't know what a wild card is, so. Let's oh, what well, a wild card is, um, so I know that um, most terrorists in Pashtun have numbers that begin with 789, and then they assign numbers out of a block of 10,000. So I'm going to put it 789, star, 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 star. Anything that has 789 as the predicate, I want that back. You can't do that. right? You have to actually have something yeah, that is targeted and focused. You have a list of 16-digit phone numbers. You have to have a list of 16-digit phone numbers. Now, you may get to a lot of phone numbers if you determine that there's a lot of members of the Pashtun sect of some terrorist organization. Right. And so uh, we also had an exchange about whether or not, through the splitting technology, all or some uh, US communications are basically routed through ISPs um, or, or telecom providers, uh, whether copies of that. The question is, we're talking about transparency. I don't know how we can have like a sensible public discussion about this. If somebody like me who teaches international law, Stanford Law School, and tries to sort of um, to, to sort of inform myself about this, is unable to figure out an authoritative answer. Right. Where would I? Where where should members of the public go? To venues just like this. Uh, um, if, if what we do is. It, the problem is because the U.S. government said nothing about these things except really. In Actually, the it said plenty about these things in front of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, in front of the Congress, in front of any number of executive branch officials. Three branches of government have talked about these. Well, that's the issue, right? And so what we're doing now is we're chasing this story that's been told breathlessly by the press. In many cases, they've got it dead wrong. The press would have told you in the summer of 2013 that NSA collected tens of millions of communications in France and they produced charts to prove it. Uh, they were absolutely 180 degrees wrong. Those communications were collected by the French. The press would have told you in the summer of 2013 that NSA committed thousands of privacy violations and produced a report to prove it. Um, that report actually showed that NSA is able to detect right, distinctions inside of its system as to when a, part, a target, something that we care about, moves from place A to place B, and it is a feature that we can determine that, and ultimately then say we're going to stop the collection, reacquire that collection under the appropriate authority, because the authority requires we know where that party is, and restart. Right? These things have to be interpreted given the totality of information available. And, and when we kind of breathlessly go off and say, I just believe the latest exhortation about splitters, um, you have to stop, pause, and think, um, would a conspiracy of that sort be possible across an organization that has arguably 35,000 people at NSA, some number of overseers, at least one for one for every one of those people. There's a person with a clipboard for every person at NSA. Would a conspiracy of that sort be possible? I'm not trying to actually then criticize your, your question. Your question's perfect. Um, but that's why I'm here at this venue. That's why any number of intelligence officials are here at this venue to actually have that conversation. Unfortunately, we've now moved to a place where we have to have that conversation to the satisfaction of 315 million people. That's not that they don't deserve a solid answer. But some of these things get very hard to have as a conversation in the details with each and every one of them. A, because these things, these details are tough to get. And B, because some of these things necessarily do get into secret corners. I don't want a rogue nation or terrorist rip worldwide to understand every piece of the details that are, that are here. So I'm struggling myself for what's the right answer to your question? How do we get those details out there sufficiently that people say, got it, I'm comfortable with that. Um, we're not there. We're clearly not there. And we're probably going to have to have some excessive, perhaps emotional conversations before we get that back to the place to describe those venues. Um, that's why I'm here to answer any and all questions you might ask about, whether it's splitters or wild cards or you know anything at a higher level of abstraction than that. So I wish I had a more succinct answer. Karen Wagner. Uh, thank you. Um, 
and I'm actually going to take a little bit of a, of a zig, and, a, and this question is really for everyone but Chris, although you're welcome to wait Excellent. if you wanted to. Because <laughs> we've been Chris talking, two. Of, you know, we're talking, talking about domestic uh, intelligence and sort of the surveillance state, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of conversations recently about how, how the intelligence community, of which I used to be a part, you know, should be thinking about doing things differently, because we are, um, there are people who have a reflexive defensive reaction that if we could just educate you, you'd understand and agree. I'm not one of those people. I think we may actually have to change some things, but you have to, we have to be thinking about it. So one long lead in. There are a lot of different kinds of surveillance, and what we've been, what I've been watching with interest and we were talking about earlier is the increasing uh, level and amount of surveillance that's happening uh, by uh, local law enforcement uh, using drones, using license plate readers, using a lot of, of tools that are available to them. And basically, uh, you know, video is different, obviously, than electronic <coughs> surveillance, but keeping that data for indefinite periods. Uh, and my experience at DHS, uh, I, I learned that every state has their own rules on what they can collect, how they can collect it, with whom they can share it, how they protect it. What are your views on whether values like necessity and proportionality will be useful in that kind of environment? Are you as are you concerned about this? And what, how would you uh, propose that we sort of think about this and address it? I feel like I'm answering every question, but um, EFF has done a lot of work on uh, on things like license plate readers and and drones and all of these things. I would say. Um, we, I, I do think that there, I mean, I'd love it if necessary proportionate came in, but I think we're going to have to stick with our own, uh, uh, at least initially, uh, given the United States view of international human rights law and its direct applicability to its people. Um, I'm going to stick with the Constitution and some of the other statutory protections. And I think we, we are going to have to think anew about this. I will point out that the feds have a lot to say about this because most, a lot of this technology got into local hands because the feds gave them money to buy it and urged them to buy it. Um, uh, things like the fusion centers and some of the other things have been great drivers for local law enforcement to get access to, to get the money to be able to get really sophisticated equipment. So it, the buck doesn't stop with the local people. So we've done a lot of work. I would say that our starting issue has been trying to do FOIA and state, you know, Public Records Act request to try to figure out what's going on and getting involved in some of the local community discussions here in Oakland. There's been a big discussion about a fusion center and and some of the other, trying to give some technical support to people who are trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so it's definitely on our radar screen and something we're trying to do a lot of and it's shrouded in a lot of secrecy right now. It's really difficult to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, the, the Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, we, we did a joint FOIA request with the, or public records request with the ACLU of Southern California, um, where they basically refused to turn over the license plate data they collected under a, a, an exception that basically said everybody was a suspect. Everybody who drove around Los Angeles during the week of Ramadan last year was a suspect, and so therefore under the law enforcement thing, they couldn't possibly turn the information over. So we got a long way to go even to get enough light on these things to figure it out. And I'll just add that from the perspective of the human rights courts and bodies that are out there adjudicating these cases, many of these issues are issues of first impression. The cases just haven't bubbled up yet, primarily because the technology is new. And in order to reach some of those bodies, you have to exhaust local remedies first. And so these cases contesting some of this stuff are percolating around in the lower domestic courts. And so they really haven't heard yet from some of these human rights bodies. Um, you know, the ICCPR, which the U.S. is subject to, there's been so many other things that the Human Rights Committee, which is the oversight body, has been worrying about that stuff like traffic light um, cameras and such just haven't really made their radar because they're worrying about drones and this and that. That's not to say that, you know, organizations like EFF can't put that information in front of those bodies in order to try and trigger a conversation, and then the United States would be in a position to have to defend those practices. Um, it's always a little tricky when you're dealing with a federal system like the United States where to what extent do local practices get up before these bodies. Technically, the, the federal government is responsible for everything that happens even in a federated system, but the, the U.S. government hasn't fully conceded that and doesn't fully report on um, things, practices, et cetera, that are happening at a local level. And so they don't necessarily come before these bodies in terms of evaluating their compliance with the treaties. All that said, there's no bar to that stuff coming before these bodies, and I think it's inevitable that they will start to now. So a, a quick point on that. The mandate of the, the board that I'm on is actions taken by the United States government 
um, to protect against terror, but one area where this question came up was on the Section 215 program, um, what to do with the data, and the question of whether you should create a third-party entity or whether the data should be retained by the providers rather than NSA. And one concern that I have had and I have expressed repeatedly with the notion of having the providers retain the data is that I think the pressure will be immense to have a data retention requirement. I don't think that folks will be comfortable relying on current FCC requirements um, for national security purposes. Um, but then that data is available in the hands of a private actor for every single state, local law enforcement, every divorce proceeding, every, I, I struggle to see how that is more privacy protective than having the data retained by the NSA in a secure facility in a very limited use fashion. Now it does not at all, that solution doesn't answer, for example, the First Amendment implications of the information being with the government, but in terms of the privacy implications, I, I think it's a very difficult question. Uh, for both. Number one or number two? <laughs> so, um, do you refer to minimization procedures as that? And as someone who's taking the Fourth Amendment law here, um, conceptually, I'm a little confused about that concept. Um, you know, the Fourth Amendment is very explicit about you know inserting a neutral magistrate in between a law enforcement officer who is you know often can be identified as carrying out carrying out crime. And so, to me, it's confusing to allow and give an agency. The ability to kind of police itself, set regulations on itself, especially in agency like the NSA, has you know a typical history. You know, I'm thinking here Operation Shamrock, you know, things of you know abuses and, and excessive um, overuse. So Most I'm of those people are dead now, but um. well, well, the point being conceptually. I think it's a fair question. Yeah. Can I answer the question? If I don't get this right, then kind of re redirect, re-steer. Um, so, so let me just describe what, what I mean by minimization. I didn't use that term. Someone else earlier did. But I refer to it inferentially when I said the burden's never removed. Um, so minimization imagines the possibility that a communication actually has two parties, right? And it turns out every communication does. Right? So if you're kind of focused legitimately on party A, but they happen to be in conversation with party B, um, then you may or may not know kind of the time of collection what the status of party B is, right? Because I'm focused on whether it's the iconic terrorist or a proliferator or all those other things that I'm authorized to collect foreign intelligence for. I you know, have to have confidence that I'm reasonably going to get this, and I have to then say, I did get that, right? That, that is, in fact, foreign intelligence relevant. But now the question is, if I at that moment discover that what's on the other end of that is a U.S. person, um, I have a burden then to minimize the conversation, the communication with respect to that person. That's when those procedures take over. Um, and that is, um, I wouldn't say simply left to NSA to do, it's actually a burden that is kind of you know, imposed upon NSA to do. Um, the court recognizing and then the executive um, order that essentially has a play when it's done under Executive Order 12333 says, your job's not over when you get the thing you were after, you now need to examine the totality of it and say, is there some innocent that came along? and you take the additional measures to protect that. And those procedures are very explicit, right? You would essentially screen out, right, the identity. You would make it clear that there was a U.S. person involved, but you could not name it. Um, any content that is not relevant to foreign intelligence, that must be you know, similarly filtered out. I mean, the rules at that point take over, and if it's a court authorization, those rules are approved by the court. So, so at that point, you know, I feel um, confident that that's actually a further imposition of burden on NSA as opposed to some back end that allows me to play willy-nilly with that. Is that the question you asked? Yeah, and just to go a little bit further. Go ahead. Then when a search is unreasonable and unconstitutional, how is it that minimization procedures can constitutionalize that? Ah, well, if the search in and of itself is unreasonable and constitutional, then the rest of it doesn't matter a whit. You're not at, you're not at that point engaged in minimization, the term of art would be um, that you have either inadvertently right, collected this, meaning it was an innocent mistake, but nonetheless a mistake, you're not entitled to the communication in any way, shape, or form, um, or that you've, commit, you've conducted, you've committed a violation, a compliance violation. Again, there's a remedy for that that says 
um, he cannot, you know, essentially at that point uh, profit from the further the poison trade. Uh, there is an exception um, which says that if you determine that there's an imminent um, risk to life and limb um, or that there is the commission of a crime and it's an innocently determined and innocently acquired communication, you have a responsibility at that point to then having found it, do something about it. Um, those rules are very analogous to what happens in criminal matters in terms of, you know, when are you authorized as a policeman to cause the trunk to be opened and if you find something in there that you hadn't anticipated, under what circumstances can you use it? Very, um, I think, reasonable rules apply to that and those rules are essentially lifted and shifted into the foreign intelligence domain. Is that the question you asked? Yeah, I'll have some follow-up. Okay. I think you've identified exactly, if you look at the hearing that we did on 702, the question that you just identified is one that folks are very much struggling with, and what are the Fourth Amendment implications of the Section 702 program, which has targeting on the front end, but does not look akin to a traditional particularized warrant on the front end. So even assuming that in 2002 the Fisker was correct that a traditional Title I FISA was the equivalent of a warrant that's absent in the 702 context. So further assuming that there is a special needs exception, which I think has been recognized, I believe by every court to have considered the question, what are the implications of a special needs requirement to the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement? It's a reasonableness analysis. The reasonable analysis itself is a totality of the circumstances test. And one of the factors in the totality of the circumstances test would certainly be the minimization requirements. And so by minimization, what are the restrictions on the use of that information? And at the risk of previewing, I'm not sure what Jamil is going to talk about. In that conversation, one of the biggest questions um, that actually I'm surprised that no one here has talked about, um, perhaps it's because it's an international law symposium is uh, traditionally once government has lawfully acquired information it can do with that information make subsequent use of it in very broad ways minimization requirements are designed to limit that use um, and one current feature is the use of u.s person identifiers to query the information that's been collected and one open question i think is what is the fourth amendment pressure that those subsequent U.S. person queries bring to bear on the program itself. So this, this question of how minimization plays into a Fourth Amendment analysis is a good one, a tough one, and I think an open one in the context of the 702 program. Uh, we have one more comment here. Yeah, so, so if there was no one else at the mic, I was actually going to address that, but I'd like to address something else first. Um, so the question that was asked often has two kind of then derivative questions that come from it, which is um, if NSA has a burden of responsibility to minimize U.S. person identifiers um, or U.S. person uh, communications, which are incidentally collected because they're the other end of something you were authorized to get, how come um, upon occasion when you're asked, do you know how many U.S. person communications you've incidentally collected, you say you can't determine that? Uh, turns out the answer to the question is you can't determine that. Um, you know, there is no way to know with 100% um, precision who the other party in a conversation is, absent some context in the conversation or absent prior knowledge about what that email identifier might be. It's, it's actually a relatively straightforward in the telephony world when area codes are assigned according to what state you're from, what country you're from, but even that will kind of bedazzle and amaze you these days given that phones roam. Um, but if you looked at my kids' email addresses, which I'm not going to share with you, um, but if you looked at them, you'd be hard-pressed to imagine what country they're from, let alone what planet they're from, you know, because they have no relationship whatsoever to anything that might connote that they're a U.S. person with Portuguese and Polish heritage. Um, is just completely um, un unparsable. Um, the second question that often comes up is the question about these, um, what had been described earlier today as backdoor searches in 702 material. I mean, I'll, I'll lay it out this way. I will necessarily give you a biased, right, you know, government perspective, and I'll kind of let the discussion then ensue around the margins over a coffee uh, cooler or water cooler later. Um, imagine that you have legitimately um, collected some number of communications pursuant to a certification under 702. Um, and I'll use the iconic um, you know, terrorism one, but it can apply elsewhere as well. That you've gone after communication after communication based upon some specific selectors. You now have a pile of communications in front of you, each and every one of which is directly responsive to a foreign intelligence query. Right? Each and every one has, in fact, looked for an email selector, a telephone number, and there's the pile of communications 
out of the sea of trillions and trillions, you now have thousands right in front of you. As an intelligence analyst, you now have an obligation. This is an NSA biased perspective. You have an obligation to figure out, given that this has now shown itself to be responsive to a foreign intelligence query, to figure out whether there's a threat in the pile. You can read those one to N. If N is in the thousands, um, you hope you get through those today um, and kind of read each and every kind of piece of the content. Or you can meaningfully use some analysis tools to say what's in the pile, right? If you had some, um, using other information, reason to believe that there was a terrorist plot against the New York Stock Exchange, you might want to say, I want to query that to see whether there's any mention of the New York Stock Exchange in there. Turns out that's a US person identifier, and that would be a violation right, of the rule that says you can't focus on a US person unless somehow there was a rule or some mechanism prescribed by the court that says, here are the conditions under which you can do that. That's the nature of the backdoor search. Right? The court actually prescribes under what conditions you can use US person identifiers to query the pile. You have to have a reasonable expectation that you will derive foreign intelligence, and you have to have some basis for that. It can't just be, I wonder if Princess Di is in this pile, or I wonder if Princess George is mentioned in the pile. That would be completely inappropriate. And it's actually specifically prohibited that you use that authority to essentially reverse target an American person because you know that you've somehow acquired communications that the other end of which have a US person in there. Now that they're in the pile, I can find them using that reverse query. I can appreciate, I do appreciate that there are enormous concerns that putting a US person identifier in the hands of an intelligence analyst then has you know, some conveyance of trust to them that they'll use that the right way. That's why that's audited. Um, but again, at the end of the day, that is an authority that can be abused. And we need to have confidence um, that it wouldn't be, that it can't be, that it will never be. Um, I would just say that Jeff Stone said something in an editorial on the 31st of March. He's the dean of the Chicago Law School. He was on the President Review Commission last summer. Um, that I found very off-putting, but at once reassuring as an American. I mean, he said in the middle of this op-ed, I've come to, despite my great cynicism and skepticism going in, come to trust NSA. But the last line in the article was, but we can never, never, never trust NSA. Um, and I take that as a statement of principle, as a statement, or rather than as a statement of conclusion. And the statement of principle is, as an American citizen, we inherently don't trust our government. That's why we wrote the Constitution the way we did. That's why we rebelled against the previous regime. Um, so I'm OK at NSA with the statement of we can never, ever, ever trust NSA. I'd just like to be worthy of it. And I'd like to have mechanisms that show that I have been worthy of it moment by moment. And so I think that's the debate that we're trying to have here is how do we get to that place? OK, so I'm going to let um, Cindy give one brief final response. Very, very um, so brief. I don't think we answered your question about what's going on in 702. They're going to come out with a report pretty soon, which I hope will outline it. And certainly there's a bunch of stuff on our website about 702. I would, I would submit to you that the fight that we're having is where does it count for purposes of a constitutional or legal yeah. analysis? At what point does it count? And what, what tends to happen is the government talks about collection. And what they mean is after they've done some processing and some other stuff is happening, and I tend to start, start at the time that the government gets custody, which I interpret the way that you and I interpret custody, which is in, whenever it's, it's doing something for the NSA as opposed to being delivered to your address. Okay, and that will have to be the last word uh, in this exchange. The exchange will continue. We have uh, Jamil Jaffer, Deputy Legal Director of the ACLU, uh, next with our final keynote, uh, and then a reception to continue the conversation. So, round of applause to our panel. Thank you.